be glorified in your holy name. You alone are worthy from everlasting unto everlasting. You alone are God. In you we live and move and have our being. Let your name be glorified. Thank you for bringing us back yet again. Lord, we pray that you engrave your word in our hearts in such a way that our lives will witness a radical transformation unto your honor and glory. Lord, that our lives hereafter will bear a permanent imprint of your presence, will bear the heartbeat of heaven, will bear the priorities of heaven. In this short time that we have to stay here, grant us the grace to live by the dictates of heaven. This is our prayer, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Matthew 28 from verse 18. Matthew 28 from verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go ye and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Hallelujah. It will be important to note that the promise of the abiding presence of Jesus is tied onto the obedience of this command to go and make disciples. It's important. I told you yesterday that God does not hear the prayer of rebels. God has no business with people who have no business with him. Jesus said, John chapter 15 verse 14, John chapter 14 verse 15, He who loves me, say, if you love me, keep my commandment. What is the commandment? Go into all the nations and make disciples. Hallelujah. We define mission simply as reaching the unreached. In this segment, I shall be looking at practical strategies, practical mission strategies in the light of 21st century challenges. Practical mission strategies in the light of 21st century challenges. Praise the Lord. So I will touch briefly on some of the critical challenges of the present day. Some of the critical challenges. Number one, the growing levels of civilization growing into secularization and then growing into nominalism. The nature of 21st century is that you have people who are civilized, who have become intrinsically secular in outreach and nominal in their attitude to religion. So, now you look at what's happening all over the world. People are basically uprooting the godly foundations on the basis of which society has been established. The same week, Ameri the American Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage was a legal 
form of marital expression in Britain. I mean, in, in America. That same week, a young man who had raised children from his sisters in Germany had those children declared as legitimate children. In other words, children raised from incestuous relationship became legitimate children. That same week, or maybe about a week after, or two weeks after, in Japan, adultery was ruled as legitimate enterprise if, if it has some business connotation. So, all over the world, the norms, the, the basic spiritual norms on the basis of which society was formed are being uprooted. So, we live in a world in which we have people who are civilized, who are secular in their orientation. That is, the basic thoughts of their lives has no place for God. For that reason, they have become the unreached. You know, previously, we used to think of mission as something you do in the hinterland. But today, we have the unreached right around us. I was saying yesterday that if you take a, a head count, of the proportion of people living in worry who have an active commitment to churches who consider themselves active members of churches you probably end up with about 10 percent or less that is secularism and so you're you're not talking about mission and you have mission fields right around you. And yet, you also have the unreached mission fields all over the world. It makes the situation compound and complex because some of the places you could define as, as Christian locations are no longer Christian. I mean, I told you yesterday that Britain, which is the headquarters of the Anglican Communion, is gradually being legitimately taken over by Islam, legitimately. The greater population of the British community is becoming legitimately Islam. Legitimately, without violence, becoming is Islamic. So you have, you have mission fields. We used, in the days, we used to study the models and theories of mission. We used to know areas called the 1040 window, which we defined by some population description in the world. Today, the nations that are supposed to be Christian are becoming secular and nominal in their religious orientation. So you have mission fields. As a matter of fact, all the models we used to think about in relation to mission are no longer useful because the mission atmosphere and mission challenge is, is changing. For that reason, we must define new missionary models. The second character of the 21st century is growing impetuous godlessness. You know, people are developing, but they are actually becoming godless. From one extreme of lack of concern about the things of God to the other extreme of growing occultism, people who go to church are becoming terribly occultic. I don't want to go into details about that, but right around you, you even have churches that are set up for satanic purposes and by satanic spirits. 
It was here in Wari that one of our church teachers who was kidnapped at Newi was eventually littered around along a foreign road. He was actually taken to a satanic altar for sacrifice. When he got to the place, you know, of course, the people that had kidnapped him had delivered him to the ritualists. You know, there are two groups of people involved in the business. There are the kidnappers who are paid about 200,000 naira. I think by now they are, they are fair. Their charge would have increased. And then there are the main ritualists. So when he got to the, to the shrine, the altar, his, his eyes were opened because they believed that there was no way he could leave the place alive. So they opened his eyes. And standing around him were four young men who had been kidnapped the same way he was kidnapped. And what he found funny was that it was a young lady around the age of, uh, the age of 30 that was standing beside five young men to sacrifice them to a satanic altar. Because around every group of kidnapped people, you would find the person sacrificing them. And as he was looking around, he saw some prominent people in society standing around five people kidnapped, you know, waiting to offer them the satanic shrine. And then, as God would have it, God intervened on his behalf and the priest of the satanic altar, at the time when he was about to be sacrificed, all the four young men in his group had been slaughtered right before him. In fact, when he was eventually rescued, there were blood spray, sprays all over him. The priest of the altar shouted and said, take this one away, take this one away. The young lady was crying and said, oh God, I have suffered for this thing. No. Instead, let me pay some more money. The man said, if, I, if you don't take this one away, we will slaughter you here. At that time, they took him away. It was the same young man that kidnapped him that had the onerous responsibility of taking him away to dump him in a river because they have a river close to the satanic shrine. It must be in between Wari and Benin. Because his eyes were covered much, much of the trip. So the young man took him and was taking him to the river to dump him. His hands and feet were still tied. So he pleaded with the young man. And the young man said, okay, I won't dump you into the river, but I will drop you somewhere in the bush. And while they were traveling, the young man said, ha, I'm very happy that they released you. In fact, ever since I arrested you, ever since I kidnapped you, my heart never knew peace at all. In the process, he asked, me, asked him, which church where you they go serve? He said, I'm an Anglican uh, church teacher. The man said, me, ma, I be Anglican. Oh, this work, where would they do? Na dangerous one. Make you na they pray for us. Oh. So the man, the man's work, it was the man who told him that for one kidnap, he is paid 200,000. Make sure that they remember us in the prayer. This is our work. No day is here. So we have a crisis in our hands. We are talking about reaching the unreached. Now, who are the reached? That is the question. Who are the reached? In our very midst are even the most, the most dangerous unreached. Fellowshipping with us every day, worshiping with us. So when we talk about mission in the 21st century, we have the unreached right around us. Agents of the devil that fellowship with us, worship with us, give tithe. When they stand up to give tithe, we also stand up to give tithe. You do not know what they are paying tithe on. Some of them are paying tithe on blood, human blood. Nobody is preaching to them. Nobody is challenging their conscience. Because the church has literally lost its mission. The church has lost its mission. And by the way, you see, 
That is the crisis of the present day mission of the church. The church has diverted from the mission of mission to the mission of infrastructure. Servicing infrastructure, building all kinds of things, skyscrapers. The church has basically lost its mission. And no doubt, people regularly come to church and go home. And they remain what they are. So, when we talk about the unreached, I think the first question we should ask ourselves is this. Who is the reached? It is a tinier and tinier proportion within the enclave called the church. That is where the crisis is. So, growing occultism in the church, in the world and in the church, that's another major 21st century challenge. The third 21st century challenge all over the world today is the growing threat of Islamic jihad. I won't talk about it in some detail again. But there are some issues I need to raise about the growing threat of Islamic jihad. Number one issue I want to make you constantly conscious of is that there is what we call radicalization going on in Islam. Ordinarily, Muslims start as very peaceful, quiet, peace-loving people. Islam has scholars who are strategists. And I've already told you that they are already strategically taking over the world. Without violence, they will ultimately take over the world because they are strategists. Secondly, all the models I have studied in mission are operative in Islam. All the models. All the models are operative in Islam. All the models. Can I talk about some of the models? The model of deep, depersonalized orientation. When Good Luck Jonathan was president, I offered to become his advisor on al education. When he set up al uh, education, I literally offered to be his advisor on al education because, number one, you see, the al philosophy is a philosophy that radically produces the personalized elements in Islam. It is the same al philosophy that Karl Marx, John Lenin, and the rest of them used in uh, communism. What was the principle in communism? Give me your child before the age of seven, and the seed I plant in him, you will not be able to uproot. That was the, that was the communist philosophy. In Islam, that philosophy is called al majiri philosophy. Between the ages of one and seven, a child is taken to a discipler. That discipler excludes that child from any contact with any information in the world except Allah said. Between that interval and seven years, the only thing that person has learned is Allah said. And that every faithful should be willing to die for what Allah said. And as long as you have that philosophical orientation, you have a system that is breeding people who will be willing to die for what Allah has said. That is a depersonalized 
orientation. Almajiris have no home. They have no family attachment. They have no filial affection. I was telling you yesterday that Christianity does not have a fundamental formation that supports mission. Almajiri philosophy has a fundamental depersonalized orientation that is detribalized without filial affection. An Almajiri person has no family. He has no father or mother to think about. He lives all his life literally in the bush besides the Almajiri philosophy prepares a person for living a selfless life. Our brother was praying a prayer about selflessness, Christian selflessness. It does not exist in our orientation, unfortunately. I told you yesterday that a man who has studied law in the university spent one year in the law school and has been called to bar accepted to be an aboki get man in a church far away from his home for the sake of Allah. Because naturally he has been brought up in a life that is detribalized, devoid of filial affection, devoid of ostentation, a life that is fundamentally and ultimately selfless. A life that is devoid of life. A life that has no life in it. He has no home. He has no comfort. He has no treasure. He has no pleasure. A life that is devoid of life. That is the orientation. Do you understand? I said that all the models I have ever studied in mission, I find them 100% in Islam. I do not see any bit of them in Christianity. That is why. If the issue of faith is an issue of logic only, the only religion that makes logical sense is Islam. Have I told you that all the people that challenge me in this life, if role model is somebody who challenges you, makes you work hard, if that is what a role model is, then all my role models in the issue of faith are Muslims. I said I make bold to say it. I have, not, I have hardly found a Christian person who, who, whose life and attitude to faith makes me work harder. I'm telling you the truth. Osama bin Laden, by 1968, when his father, Mohammed bin Laden, died, Mohammed bin Laden was a multi billionaire oil magnate with heavy investment in America. From 1931, when America discovered oil in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Laden was one of those that became great oil magnates with heavy investments in America. Osama bin Laden in 1968 as a small boy earned from his father 32 million US dollars. At that time, Nigeria's annual budget was probably around 250,000 US dollars. So, Osama bin Laden had wealth estimated at the annual budget of Nigeria for about 120 years. You know what he did with that money? He surrendered it at the feet of his pastors and mentors. One of them is a man called Saeed Kutib. The other one is a man called Azam. Those were his pastors, his mentors. What were they teaching Osama bin Laden? Americans were coming to Saudi Arabia 
for oil mining. They would pray in the church on Sunday, but all through the week, they will walk about on the streets naked, dance disco, do all kinds of funny things. Wahid Azam and Kutib, who we are Osama bin Laden's mentors, we are teaching him that these people are infidels. They don't have any religion. Bin Laden became a convert. Now, let me come back. Let me not digress. Radicalization is going on in Islam every day. More and more peaceful Muslims are being converted to radical suicide bombers every day. Every day. Do you know the young Nigerian who was caught in London where he was making an effort to explode an aircraft? His name is Farouk. God saved the aircraft. A man who was trained in Yemen for years on exploding uh, bombs. That day, his skill failed him because God arose. The explosive made a popping sound and released some smoke and refused to explode and they caught him. His name is Farouk. When they investigated him, they found that the man had over 30 million British pounds to his account. Why would a man worth over 30 million British pounds want to kill himself in suicide bombing? Is it because somebody dashed him money? No. It is because somebody taught him selflessness for Allah. That is what nobody has taught us. Do you understand? So when I look at, when I look at, oh my God, when I look at, when I look at the oppression of the church, the whole thing seems to me like organized hypocrisy. That's what it looks to me. I'm sorry. But that is my observation. I am an analyst. I'm a scientist by training. I am doing simple analysis. When I look at what we do in the church and look at what people do to worship the God they worship, something tells me that we are a bunch of bunch of hypocrites. People who don't believe anything. Who don't hold anything seriously. Anyway, thank you for bringing me to this program because from last night, the Lord began to speak to me about a new project he wants me to get involved in. I have stopped complaining about what people are doing or what they are not doing. I have made up my mind to keep doing what I'm able to do as long as God helps me. From late last night, the Lord began to speak to me about the thousands of internally displaced persons in different parts of the north. I don't know why it never really struck me. God was saying to me, why is it so difficult for Christians to perceive the realities around them? White people are coming from America, from Europe, to bring food to internally displaced persons in different camps in different parts of northern Nigeria. Christians in southwest, southeast, south-south, multi-billionaires are looking the other way as if it is not their business. You know what God has told me in the course of this meeting? And I thank you for bringing me here so that I could listen to God. The Lord is saying to me that the time has come to send missionaries to the internally displaced persons camps and send food. As a matter of fact, for, for a long time now, it has been in the news that the people are starving. The food items brought to them from America and from Europe some people in this country are stealing them and keeping the people starving. Many of them are Christians. Some of them are Muslims. But whether Christians or Muslims, they are existing mission fields 
that are lying fallow. And because the church does not see, the church cannot appreciate big mission fields that God has created, effectively guarded by soldiers of the federal government. Mission fields wasting away. And people are still doing ceremonial mission. My prayer is that this thing will not end a ceremony. As for me, I have stopped complaining. I have stopped looking at who is doing what. I do my own. So that brings me to issues of strategies. I have categorized the mission strategies into four different levels. You know, in the past, we used to have different categories of mission participants. We used to talk about the mission goers, people who go to mission field. We used to talk about mission givers, people who regularly give to support mission. We used to talk about mission groaners, people who are praying and groaning over those who are in the mission field. But I'm not interested in all those things anymore because if you, the, the larger population of the church is not interested. But actually, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, I have created categories that have enough room for anybody who wants to do the bidding of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And I say this repeatedly. God does not answer the prayers of rebels. It is in the church that you have rebels. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do what I've asked you to do? Meaning that to call him Lord primarily and singularly and ultimately implies doing what he has commanded. In fact, it is better to do what he has commanded and not even call him Lord than call him Lord. Hallelujah. It's better to do what he has commanded than sing Lord, Lord and live like a rebel. So I said I've created four categories. Number one category is the category I've called the micro mini mission level. Micro mini mission level. That is the level at which every individual can operate. Now this micro mini mission level is a level of adoption. I know a family in the north, all they are doing is adopting homeless, house of Fulani people and training them in their homes. There is nobody here who cannot practice adoption. Now, there, again, there are different levels and implications of adoption. You can actually adopt people and they are not living in your house. But you superintend over their lives. They become your project. There are other levels of personal adoption. There are levels of financial responsibility, you know, over a person's life, you know, which one person can very effectively adopt and superintend over. I told you yesterday that this is now my 10th year in a missionary diocese. And in that diocese, we have actually adopted a community and we are doing mission in the community. We are paying mission workers in the community and um, we are doing a lot more. There is no one individual who cannot adopt. 
It begins with a practical interest in somebody's life. It begins with a, a practical, personal involvement in somebody's life. You know, some of these things we do that we say we are going for a mission. And then we just uh, maybe enter the boat and travel to one location and preach and preach and preach and distribute gifts to them and go away. And nobody is concerned about what is happening to them thereafter. That is a hit and run operation. In many cases, there are no follow-up procedures and the thing is just a wasted effort. It's even better that individual persons operate on individual persons' lives at the level that they can operate. I have a young man who is a missionary in Saudi Arabia. He is an accountant. And God gave him an international job in Saudi Arabia. And every day, they have break time. One hour every day. And every day, he holds a mini instruction session in his office. About 30, 40 minutes every day. And he buys some recreation. So, in place of people paying for their you know, recreation or their entertainment, they simply walk in there and the young man will give them wise instruction. Many times, he will give them some scripture without necessarily telling them it is from the scripture. He might say to them, I can do all things. Uh, or maybe uh, it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And then he just instructs them. 30 minutes every day. You know, people who are committed to the business of mission can explore their environment. There is always something you can do in your environment to touch somebody's life. Make a living impact in somebody's life for Christ's sake. Adoption level. There is also a micro mini project level. For instance, yesterday, I talked about our attitude to education. And I pointed out that the Christian schools in this country are the most unaffordable. From the nursery school level to the tertiary level, they are the most unaffordable. In different parts of the country now, even more emphatically, in the southern part of the country, you have Muslim locations, you have Muslim schools, and it is entirely all costs paid program. So somebody, it, many individuals can afford it. Many individuals can afford it. You don't have to travel to Togo or travel to Congo, Congo, Brazzaville, or travel to Sierra Leone to be a missionary. You can be a missionary right here. You can start raising children. In fact, I have a standing invitation on my desk to come and live and work in the U.S. I have con continuously turned it down. For quite some time, I have turned it down. And recently, I started considering it. The only reason I started considering it is to be able to get to the U.S., and raise a nursery school and begin to teach people from the scratch. That is, that is mission. Do you understand? Now, so there is the micro-mini level. There is the micro-maxi level. Meaning that one individual can grow from adopting one person to adopting a village. One individual can do it. There are many individuals that God has blessed. Anyway, I'm, I've, I've, I have stopped talking about people whom God has blessed. There is nobody that God has not blessed. There's nobody God has not blessed. There is nobody 
who cannot adopt a family, who cannot grow in levels of personal involvement. And then, of course, there are, you know, there are individuals that can set up projects. Are you aware that there is one man, you sometimes see the adverts, you know, on, on uh, global channels, one man on, on cable, cable channels, you find one man who is working on the water project to, um, pr to provide water to over 70 million Africans. The man is a Muslim. One man. And you think he takes water to a community and he doesn't share his faith in the community. No. He is doing it for a religious purpose. And it is effectively working for him. The first time I saw the Jair Bank in Nigeria, I remembered where I first learned about it in Britain. Actually, I had known that that bank has its roots in Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm sure you know that Islamic financial operations are being gradually admitted into the country. In fact, it was Sanusi, Lamido Sanusi, who first introduced the principles of Islamic banking in Nigeria. Now, what is the strategic thing about Islamic banking? Islamic banking is actually a financial operation that operates on the basis of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 and chapter 4. An assemblage of brethren where people can share resources so that people own things in common and nobody said that anything belonged to him. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Actually, that is how Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, ended. And then in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, the Bible tells us of a man and his wife who attempted to follow, yet they did not have the orientation that the others had. You know, something had become popular, showing that it had become a way of life for the people. Listen now. I have been asking myself, what has the church done with billions of naira that has passed through its hands all through the ages? I can take you along to London and show you houses owned by Nigerian church ministers in the heart of London where English people cannot afford to buy houses. In Nigeria where poverty, poverty level is going be below manageable proportions. Nigeria. Poverty indices. Oh, two years ago, three years ago, some Nigerian leaders applied for certain levels of uh, World Bank and International Monetary Fund loans on behalf of Nigeria. The World Bank, the authorities of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund examined the application and concluded and wrote it down that the indices available about Nigeria do not show Nigeria as a poor country. Because Nigerians own the costliest estates in Europe and America. And yet, poverty levels, poverty levels are below tolerable proportions. Tolerable proportions by global indices. Poverty levels below tolerable proportions in Nigeria. What does it amount to? It amounts to callousness. To think that the church has a hand in this callous deprivation makes me sick about wearing an identity of the church. Makes me a participant in the callous deprivation. I will show you in the heart of London. Houses belonging to he 
heads of churches in Nigeria. We're talking about mission. There is something called financial mission. I told you yesterday that a young man brought a form, Buba Marowa Educational Foundation Fund to me. One man, one man. And there are thousands of formerly Christian students who have benefited from Buba Marowa Educational Foundation Fund. That is only one fund. There are many others. Formerly Christian students. Many of them have become Muslims. How? They have gone on holidays to Dubai and Saudi Arabia. They have gone for Hajj. And they have come back. You think they will come back carrying the Bible? Who told you? Did you remember them in their crisis? I was a guest of the University of Portacourt Chapel. And I saw a large mosque in the place. And I was told of a Muslim professor who is single-handedly evangelizing the University of Portacourt for Islam. How does he do it? Financial resource evangelism. Many students are on the list of his patronage. You think they will come back and remain Christians. You are fooling yourself. Do you understand? We haven't started thinking yet. So there are things. When I talk about the micro level, I am thinking about things that individual persons are doing. Micro in terms of personality. Micro mini in terms of the least an individual can do. Micro maxi in terms of the highest level of what an individual person can do. Somebody hear me? al Haji Dan Tata has a large, large number of personal employees. The richest African man today. Do you know his name? Eh? Dangote. Thank God you know. One man who is worth, I think by two, two or three years figures, 13 billion US dollars. He has employees running into hundreds of thousands. And many of them are at various stages of conversion to Islam. I went into an office in Abuja. I was in somebody's office. Um, okay, in the bank. And a, a young lady was driven in in a large vehicle. And she was uh, dressed in a funny way. And as she was coming into the bank, she was moving from one office to another, issuing instructions, issuing all kinds of orders. And then went around a little and went upstairs. Right? And one young man who was there shook his head. And I wanted to find out. You know, I'm a curious person. I wanted to find out why he shook his head. I said, uh, that must be one of the directors of the bank. He said, no. He said, I was here when this girl came in as a youth copper from southeast. Do you understand? Today she is al -Hajja. Little girl. Onibu. One name, my sister. Today she is al -Hajja. Came in as a small girl, youth copper. That is a project going on. Are you still thinking about mission? It is a serious project and it's going on at different levels. That is the micro level. The level at which 
individuals like us can operate. So as you go from here, you can be thinking, what can I do? I have already told you the new assignment God gave me. As I leave from here, I told you yesterday, next weekend we shall be in Kafanchan. And there I will tidy up operations about sending missionaries into all the internally displaced persons camps. And I will visit them myself to the glory of God. So I've stopped worrying who is doing what and who is not doing what. Like I said, it is not anybody's fault. It is the fault of the structure we operate. And by the way, when we talk about structure, what are the kind of things we are concerned about? It is the priorities that we have set for ourselves. But what are those priorities? We are setting up priorities that will eventually collapse the church. I lived in Huddersfield where the church had collapsed. You know, as a fresh student in, uh, in Huddersfield, we were treated to um, some soap opera entertainment in a very beautiful hall. And um, in the course of the entertainment, some young women were brought on stage and they were dancing naked on stage. And the commentator said something that made me nearly faint in the hall. What did he say? He said, oh, the place that is used as the stage for this beautiful dance display is the place that used to be the altar of uh, St. Paul's Anglican Church Huddersfield Town Center, Queen's Gate, Huddersfield. The entire beautiful structure we were in was a place that used to be St. Paul's Anglican Church, Huddersfield Town Center, Queen's Gate, Huddersfield. The population of the church thinned down so much that maintaining the church became a problem. They had to cut off the choir stall of the church as the main church so that they could provide effective warming for the choir stall. The choir stall could take the total population of the church. And of course, the population continued to reduce until it, beca it became impossible to maintain it. And they sold that building at the cost of one pound to the Polytechnic of Huddersfield, presently the University of Huddersfield. The deed of transference was signed upon the payment of one pound. In other words, the church was, was willing to throw away the structure. I have lived in Europe where the church has collapsed. It is so easy. It begins like this, actually. It begins with a collapse of attitude. And then, what is left is mere empty ceremony that people will very easily throw away and go their way. That is why I began to talk about the growing secularism in the church. For your information, the only religion that is witnessing a genuine revival in the world is Islam. Genuine revival. May God have mercy upon us. So, we are sharing this so that peradventure by the mercy of God we shall wake up again to responsibility. No organization ever survived except on the platform of responsibility. We must arise afresh onto responsibility. So, I've discussed the first two levels micro mini level micro maxi level meaning that ordinary individuals like you and me can actually run projects that will help sustain people in the faith if you live a mission based life like i was saying yesterday that the church must transit from mission as an occasional ceremony the mission as a regular life. You know, mission as one week of mission to mission as regular life. That is, every day you live, 
your life is affecting people. You have people you are working on. When your life comes to that point, you are doing the will of the master. Now, when we come to macro levels of operation, we are now coming to operations that individuals cannot do on their own. We are now talking about group levels. So you have the macro mini operation, a situation that two or three people can partner together to run a project for the sake of schooling people in the business of God. Now, um, I was uh, reading the, a national magazine recently, and somebody was grumbling. If, if you go to Covenant University, to the glory of God, the people that study there are compelled to pray regularly. They are compelled to certain hours of prayer. And as a matter of fact, that is one way you can make an investment in people's lives. Covenant University is rated as one of the best universities in Nigeria, if not the very best. And so it has attracted the cream of the Nigerian society. So properly utilized, it becomes a veritable instrument of mission. That is, the, that is my understanding of present day mission. And of course, that is situating mission in people's normal course of daily life. Situating mission in people's normal course of life. In other words, carrying mission to where the people are. Making it impossible for them to escape your missionary uh, operation. That is where your life begins to become relevant to people's lives. I have not started seeing any such thing in the church. Now, the fourth segment is the macro maxi level of mission operation. And it is here that I want to bring in certain challenges facing the church in Nigeria and all over the world. Macro maxi, that is the things that must be done at group levels at the fullest level of operation. Now let me say this. The most threatening challenge facing the church in Nigeria, not just in Nigeria but all over the world, is the challenge of survival, the challenge of security. Now, at this level, you are no longer thinking about what an individual can do or what a small group can do. You are now thinking about macro maxi levels which will involve corporate networks Corporate systems of power. Corporate networks of political power. Let me explain this point fully. Because that is the highest level of corporate networking for the survival of the church. Well, unless you believe that God wants us to be wiped out so that we will go to heaven. Maybe that's what God wants. In September last year, after months of operation of ISIS, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, was a network formed in the Persian Gulf, specifically for slaughtering Christians. They would slaughter Christians in their hundreds and post their videos on, te on television, on the internet. Many times I would watch such videos and weep. Many times I would uh, get prayer requests. Pray. The ISIS will slaughter 150 Christians tonight by, from 11 p.m. Pray. And sometimes I would say to myself, God, is this your will for us? Or is there something else we can do? And, and I keep wondering, 
Why does the church not think survival? Why? So suddenly in September, Vladimir Putin, Russian president, on his own, loaded aircrafts and began to bomb ISIS networks and installations and camps in Syria and in the Persian Gulf. And um, the first thing that happened as a reaction was that America threatened to bomb, bomb Russian aircrafts. In fact, between September and October last year, America assembled 23 nations around Europe and all those European allies to attack um, Russia in the Persian Gulf. And uh, China announced their willingness to take sides with Russia. And I said to myself that we, we are actually on the threshold of the Third World War because that was exactly how the Second World War started. It started by some kind of alignment of nations, started by a simple operation, and the nations took sides, and the war blossomed. Today, it has been persistent in the news that a Russian aircraft has been shot down in Syria. It's part of Russian operation. Now, it's amazing. Russia is not a Christian nation. In fact, Vladimir Putin, two weeks into the bombing of ISIS regions, called on American President Obama Barack and said, why, for goodness sake, are you not protecting your brothers in the Persian Gulf? That was two weeks into the bombing. Two weeks afterwards, Vladimir Putin published the results of his personal investigation into ISIS operations. From that report, we learned two things. Number one, that America under Barack Obama has been the greatest sponsor of the ISIS to slaughter Christians. And number two, that inside the heartland of America, there are ISIS training camps in America supported by Obama Barack. Not long afterwards, an American pastor came to the public and announced that he was the one who packaged Obama Barack as a Christian in 2008 to enable him win an election. He confessed that actually it was to his knowledge that Obama Barack was a Muslim, but had asked for his assistance for a Christian packaging so that he could be appealing to the Christian community. When I heard it, it confirmed a suspicion I had announced for many years. Before 2008, America was the closest ally to Israel. From 2008, American policy changed so drastically that in less than four years of Obama Barack's first tenure, America had become the greatest enemy of Israel. Today, America is not only the largest sponsor of ISIS for the slaughter of Christians, America, it has also been made public, has become the greatest sponsor of the nuclear project of Iran for the destruction of Christians in the Persian Gulf. So, the major crisis facing Christianity in this age is the crisis of survival. Now, at this level, no one individual can do anything. Unfortunately, Christians are the most unknowledgeable as far as the issues of the threats facing Christianity are concerned. There are two major projects facing us in Nigeria. If we are not careful, if we are not careful, in the next four years, Christianity will begin to become history. I have taken time to study the 
history of Christianity in the post Boko Haram bombing era. Boko Haram bombing started effectively from 2009. 2009 to 2016 is a period of seven years. But Christianity in the north has been substantially reduced to close to 50%. Some of the areas where you can see boost of Christianity in the north are actually the areas that we traditionally call the middle belt. There is something that is happening in Nigeria now. I told you yesterday, and it was late last night that the Lord began to make the picture clearer to me. Some of the internally displaced persons will never go back to their homes again. Because their areas have been taken over. Many of them are Christians who are running away from Islamic persecution. The final onslaught over Nigeria will take place around the Middle Belt. And that final onslaught will determine not only the future of Nigeria, but the survival of Christianity in this country. In the last dispensation in Nigeria, prior to the present dispensation, I was holding a crusade in Abuja. There were government officials at that meeting. And some of them asked for private discussion with me. And I volunteered. And we held some discussions. And I thought I was uh, speaking to people who had a concern for the critical security situation in the country. And I made some very vital suggestions about taking the security challenge over the church in Nigeria to the next level. Um, some of the issues around gradual, you know, sensitization on security awareness, at least even up to the level of, you know, um, proliferation of security sensors. And I wonder why the church is an unmindful organization. At that time, on the average, 28 churches were being burnt down every week. And yet, it is amazing that none of those churches had sensors, at least minimum sensors. And I was saying to myself that if nothing, the time has come to elevate the level of our brigade operations just one level higher in terms of security, awareness, sensitization, and preparation. And I bared my mind, and I almost got into severe crisis for bearing my mind. Today, we have lost a critical opportunity we may never have again. Never. So that's how the situation is. Anyway, two major challenges face us in Nigeria. Number one is survival. Number two is relaunching mission to the north. When it comes to relaunching mission to the north, it has got to be a strategic, systematic operation involving all the elements of vital missionary operation. What are the elements of vital missionary operation? Well, internal operations of adoption, operations on facilities, health facilities, educational facilities, financial operations, and so on. You know, infrastructural facilities, and so on. Listen now. It has come to a point where relaunching mission to the north has got to be strategic, systematic, project-based. In other words, you take a project and you hide behind that project to do mission. I told you yesterday that Maman El Rafai in Kaduna started with a law that you couldn't preach the gospel in Kaduna unless you had a government certified license. 
And while we were still discussing it, 19 states of the, of the north adopted that law. The doors are closing. But the doors cannot close on projects. But anyway, what we couldn't do on a platform of ease and comfort, we now have to do at a heavy cost. But think about it. If we do not relaunch Christian mission to the north, what will happen to the Christians that are existing in the north? And that is my primary headache and worry because I am in touch with the Christians in the north. You don't hear news in this country. Virtually every night, the so-called Fulani headsmen unleash themselves at Christian communities in the north. Slaughter people. By the time you wake up in the morning, you see corpses of people littered on the streets and nobody is permitted to talk about it openly. And their worry is, what is all this coming to? Some of them in the further areas of the north are moving closer to the mid middle belt. And because we don't understand it, by now, we are supposed to have started rallying around the middle belt in terms of strategic support and in terms of mission operation. Did you hear me? By now, after seven years of strategic jihadic bombing of the north, by now, we are supposed to have effectively galvanized ourselves into a support network around the middle belt for strategic mission and for systematic support. And we are not yet galvanized. We will pay heavily for it. God have mercy on us. Once the middle belt is overrun, this country is gone. Once the middle belt Oh my God. Once the middle belt is ever run, and as I'm looking at the situation, there are all the facilities on the ground for overrunning the middle belt. What am I even talking about overrunning? I told you that Islam is traditionally diffused and selfless. Many of the motorcycle riders on the streets here Islam. So, the network is already effectively mobilized. And in all the nukes and crannies of southeast, southwest, south, south, why? Oh my God. Why are we, why? What, what makes us feel safe? What? Let me tell you what the Lord told me as I ran off. God told me. He said, as long as the church continues to live in rebellion, so long will I turn my back on the church. As I round off, let me tell you this. The only bribe we can give to God to win back his love to us is to unleash ourselves a mission. Everybody, no exception. There is no goer. There is no giver. There is no groaner. Everybody, mission. There is nobody who cannot do mission. Nobody. There is nobody who cannot do mission. The only way we can win back the love of God to us. John chapter 14 verse 15. John chapter 15 verse 14. If you love me, Keep my commandment. The one that loves me, he it is that keeps my commandment. The one who keeps my commandment, he it is that loves me. The only index by which Christ measures love is that you keep his commandment. What is the commandment above all commandments? All authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go ye into all the nations. Make disciples. The only bribe we can give God to win 
back his love unto us is that we unleash ourselves in mission. It begins with fundamental, structural selflessness. I told you, I am almost single-handedly maintaining a mission field in one area in Abia. I run projects running into millions of naira. I don't even have a good car I move about with. But I run projects for God's sake, running into millions of naira. Every money that enters my hand goes into strategic divine projects. And this afternoon, when I thought I was already doing enough, God sent to me, God said to me, why is the church not perceiving empty, fallow mission fields in the IDPs? What does it mean? The IDPs are starving, internally displaced persons. People are bringing food from America, Europe, to Nigeria. Are there churches in Nigeria or not? In the same land where there are billionaire, billionaire pastors, billionaire preachers. Shame on all of us. Shame. Are we, are we disciples of Jesus Christ or are we empty talking hypocrites? What are we? What are we? Think about it. What are you personally? Let's stop now talking about who didn't do what and who did what. Talk about yourself. What am I doing for the kingdom? What am I doing for the kingdom? We have a very short time to do what we are doing now. What we don't do now, we will never get a chance to do. Some of the money you are packing in the bank, I saw how people were giving offering yesterday and I, my heart was bleeding. Some of the money you are packing in the bank will be there while you are no more. That is true. Some of the money you are packing in the bank, you will not have a chance to use them. One person you adopt onto the business of our Lord Jesus Christ reduces the number of al suicide bombers by one. You know, I used to think that House of Fulani we are in penetrable with the gospel, but it is not true. I used to think that al people are hard, hard hearted, but it's not true. They were not born like that. Somebody planted some seeds inside them. In the same way, somebody can plant some seeds in homeless little children and raise ministers for the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Close your eyes for a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.